It's 1966, the height of the Vietnam War, when Lance Corporal Richard Pittman and the rest of his platoon stumble into a living hell. It's an ambush. Nobody could have seen this attack coming, and with no way to plan for it, it's quickly turning from a fight to a massacre. Pittman and his fellow surviving troops are hopelessly pinned down, with no avenue for escape. The radios squawk with desperate requests for reinforcements, but it seems like those prayers are falling on deaf ears. Then something heavy lands in front of the Lance Corporal, dropped by one of his fallen comrades. It's easily over 20 pounds, much heavier than that rifle in his hands that feels like a flimsy cap gun by comparison. Pittman hurls his current firearm to the ground, making a mad dash forward to grab the bulkier weapon, an act that completely shirks his own safety in favor of the remnants of his platoon. He hoists the bulky weapon off the ground with all of his strength and squeezes the trigger. Bullets spew from the barrel at a rate fast enough to send over 500 rounds toward a target in a single minute. As he feels the immense kick of the recoil, sending the weapon stock shuddering back, connecting with his own body, Pittman realizes why the rest of the boys took to calling it the pig. Mere minutes and a hail of bullets later, two of the enemy's machine gun posts had been destroyed single-handedly by Pittman and the pig he was now carrying. No time for celebrations, however, as before long the explosions of mortar fire rock the area around him, and the Lance Corporal is forced to haul all 23 pounds of the weapon in his hands as he makes a break for cover. Nearby, some of his fellow Marines are wounded, and he races over to them only to be met with an oncoming attack of around 40 enemy soldiers charging at their position. Taking up the pig again, Pittman opens fire. The machine gun chews through the belt that feeds bullets into it, raining empty casings as it sprays wave after wave of oncoming attackers. But before long, the pig is running on empty, and Lance Corporal Pittman is forced to drop the heavy weapon. Grabbing a firearm from one of his comrades and clearing the area with a grenade, Lance Corporal Pittman kept up the fight while dragging the wounded troops to a position with better cover. Pittman near single-handedly thwarted an enemy attack that day and was awarded the Medal of Honor for saving the lives of his platoon. But he didn't exactly do it alone. Lance Corporal Pittman had a little helping hand from a weapon that seen plenty of action over the previous 66 years. Nicknamed for its bulky size and appetite for eating up ammunition, this not-so-little piggy has served with almost every branch of the United States military, and to this day, it's still used by the armed forces of multiple countries around the world. Say hello to the M60 machine gun. The M60 may have started to see action when it was first deployed in 1957, but it actually began its life much earlier in the late 1940s, in the wake of the Second World War and a victory for the Allied forces over Nazi Germany. The US Army was looking for ways to incorporate weapons that were similar to certain weapons that the German Army had used during World War II. Many of these offered troops flexibility in how their weapons were used on the battlefield, and it was this that the Allies, especially the US, sought to incorporate into their own new weapons most notably the FG-42 automatic rifle and the MG-42 general-purpose machine gun were two pre-existing German weapons that directly influenced the design of the M60. Although the use of light machine guns on the battlefield hadn't been a recent innovation, having been used since the introduction of the Danish Madsen in the early 1900s, the M60 was intended to be a crew-served weapon. That means that it and other weapon systems like it would be operated by a crew of two or more individual soldiers. Each member of the crew would perform tasks that enabled the weapon itself to run at maximum operational efficiency. In the case of the M60, the crew operating it would consist of three members. First and foremost, there would be the gunner, as you can imagine the person responsible for aiming and firing the weapon. They would also be responsible for carrying the M60 and, depending on their level of stamina, between 200 and 1,000 rounds of ammo. Alongside them would be the assistant gunner, whose job it was to carry spare ammunition and a spare barrel. The M60's barrel could be quickly changed out in the event of a jam or overheating. The assistant would also reload the M60 once it ran empty and spot targets for the gunner. Then thirdly, the remaining member of the crew was to be the ammunition bearer. They would also be responsible for bringing additional ammo of their own, along with a tripod, should the M60 need to be mounted for stability. However, one of the key elements of the M60's design was that it was also intended to be fired accurately from the shoulder, at least at a short range. This was a feature that during the weapon's development was carried over from the pre-existing M1918 Browning Automatic Rifle, or BAR. Given the size, weight, and bulk of the M60, it could also be fitted with an integral bipod, which are two legs at the front of the weapon that can fold under the barrel and, when extended, can bear some of the weight to help stabilize the machine gun. Now, the question you might be pondering is if the US Army had access to existing weapons that their M60 was derived from, 
why go to all the trouble to manufacture their own version in the first place? Well, it largely came from a requirement all the way from the United States Congress. This gave preference to weapon designs that came from American arms manufacturers, primarily so the US couldn't incur licensing fees for the use of foreign designed and manufactured arms, like the aforementioned MG42. Additionally, Congress also wanted their military to be seen supporting US firms, so the decision to develop and adopt the M60 largely came about due to it being an all-American light machine gun. The M60 was first introduced and deployed in 1957 and incorporated various features of the earlier weapons that inspired its design. Perhaps its most distinctive feature was that it was a belt-fed machine gun that incorporated disintegrating links. Now, don't worry if those words all sound a bit too confusingly technical, we'll explain what we mean. A belt-fed weapon, or one that uses an ammunition belt, is any firearm that's fed ammo cartridges that are strung together. This is typically seen in a lot of rapid-firing automatic weapons, with the ammunition belt either feeding into the weapon freely or packed into a belt container that allows for more portability. The reason this is done, as was the case with the M60, is to minimize the impact that the weight of the ammunition had on the operational efficiency of the weapon. After all, carrying around one of these is hard work especially without the other two members of the crew present. No soldier armed with an M60 wants to be weighed down by the bullets. The belt-fed ammunition of the M60 also allowed the machine gun to have a higher rate of continuous fire without the need to frequently change magazines. The specific ammunition fired by the M60 was the 7.62 by 51 mm NATO cartridge, bullets that were commonly used in larger rifles. These cartridges would be strung together in a belt of what were known as M13 links. This is a designation given to a particular type of ammunition belt, sometimes referred to by the US military as disintegrating links. These were specifically designed to bind 7.62 by 51 mm NATO cartridges together, and so the M60 was designed with this in mind. Whereas some older designs of links were connecting cartridges to each other at the neck, the links holding the M60's ammunition were intended to disintegrate after firing each shot well, not literally turn to dust, but come apart in a way that meant there was no excess weight of an empty ammo belt to carry. Each round fed into the M60 would be contained in one of those links. A semicircular loop holds the main body of the cartridge casing, while two small arms connect to similar loops that hold the next round in the belt. As the trigger of an M60 is pulled and the weapon is fired, the cartridge is pushed out of the links as the bolt of the machine gun goes forward. Within the internal mechanism of the M60 is what's known as a feeding pawl, which pulls the belt to the right, bringing the next round into place ready to be fired. Meanwhile, the expended bullet casing is ejected out of the right side of the weapon. Thanks to the design of the disintegrating belt, the now loose link that held the previous round comes apart and is also ejected along with the empty casing. By the time the M60 saw its first ever deployments, the United States was already well into the second year of the Vietnam War. Many of their units were issued M60 machine guns, and these new weapons would often play decisive roles in the fighting. Before long, M60s were mounted on vehicles of every kind. The whole US military arsenal had been kitted out with these shiny belt-fed killing machines. Everything from choppers to tanks, trucks, and even boats had an M60 fitted on it, as the light machine gun was used in every conceivable way it could be. M60s were set up on tripods and fortifications to defend areas from attack while US troops wore belts of its ammunition draped over their shoulders in order to carry the heavy ammo and keep their hands free to use and operate the weapon. Soldiers came to appreciate how well the M60 handled, along with the mechanical simplicity of its design, which made it easy to maintain and repair in case of damage. The newly deployed machine gun saw its widest ever use among the US infantry during the Vietnam War. However, it was far from a game changer for the US whose forces would ultimately be forced to evacuate from Vietnam in 1973. Despite the effectiveness of the weapon in combat, the M60 along with a lot of other American weapons wasn't well suited for the tropical climate and the harsh conditions of Vietnam. The pig, as its nickname partially suggests, was a heavy beast, combined having to carry a combined nearly 30 pounds of weaponry and ammo while in the blistering jungle heat and intense humidity and you're looking at a back-breaking task for even the toughest soldier. The environment of Vietnam also caused a lot of M60 machine guns to break. The weapon itself being designed to be carried by a single soldier meant that it had to be relatively lightweight, at least when compared to heavier artillery. But this lightweight construction meant the M60 was prone to malfunction, as critical parts like the bolt and the operating rod could wear away with continued use or become damaged in the kind of minor accidents you're likely to see in an active war zone. Jams were not uncommon too, 
especially when the M60s got dirty. And if spent bullet cartridges or the disintegrating links of the ammunition belt ever failed to eject from the chamber, then soldiers would require extra time to fix it and feed the belt back into their M60, which wasn't exactly the most ideal situation to be in if an enemy soldier was running at you. The M60 also featured a swinging lever that jutted out of its main body, and if this ever snagged the soldier's gear, it could detach the barrel and cause that crucial component to come away. It was for many of these reasons that Marine units didn't initially use the M60, instead preferring to stick to their older bars instead. However, the US Navy SEALs, the renowned Special Operations Force, were known to have a certain fondness for the machine gun. During the Vietnam War, they even utilized their own custom versions of the M60 machine gun, which sported shorter barrels and belts that fed into the weapons from backpacks full of ammunition, allowing for hundreds of rounds worth of uninterrupted fire without the need to reload. These weren't the only variants of the M60 to exist either. One of the first variants that was developed and issued to troops was the M60E1. This differed slightly from the original M60 when it came to placement of the bipod. The two legs could be utilized to stabilize the weapon during continuous fire. On the M60, the bipod was located beneath the barrel, which could provide the necessary support but also ran the risk of getting in the way when the weapon's barrel needed changing. The M60 operator's manual recommended that soldiers perform a barrel change every 10 minutes, and during an engagement, a few seconds where that action is interrupted by the bipod being in the way could have made a crucial difference. So the M60E1's bipod was moved to the gun's gas tube, making these quick changes slightly easier. Later versions included the M60E3, which instead had its bipod mounted on the weapon's receiver, and it came with an ambidextrous safety switch and was overall 5 pounds lighter than previous iterations of the M60. However, this lighter frame and the M60E3's skinnier barrel meant this version was more prone to overheating and breaking. Eventually, while there's still some continued use of them today, the M60 would come to be replaced in the US Army by a pair of newer light machine guns. One of these is the M240 machine gun first introduced in the 1970s. Comparably, this weapon was heavier than its predecessor, however, thanks to its improved design, it was considerably more reliable. The other was the M249 Squad Automatic Weapon, or SAW, which was much lighter. The M249 SAW combined the high rate of fire of weapons like the M60 with the lightweight portability and accuracy of a rifle. However, while most of the US Army and the Marine Corps started using these newer weapons, the M60's day wasn't quite done. The Navy SEALs had embraced the M60 since the Vietnam War, and the weapon's final iteration, the M60E4, saw a lot of usage among their ranks, becoming the most reliable model of the machine gun. This was in part due to the improvements that the M60E4 had over the original, including a selection of long and short barrel options for different ranged encounters. The M60E4 was also much lighter than both the M60 and the newer M240 machine guns, with an overall weight of around 21 pounds. Add that to the fact that the gun's barrels were lined with stellite, which improved the weapon's resistance to overheating and stopped it from wearing out as easily, and it also came with rails for attaching optics, as well as being lighter and smaller than the M240s. It was also reported to work more reliably in salt water, perfect for the SEALs who are known to conduct amphibious operations. Given that they're often sent on raiding missions and missions where it's essential for them to travel as light as possible, that makes the M60E4 far better suited for the type of operations the Navy SEALs are deployed on. Although, for the most part, the pig has been put back in the barn by a lot of the US military, surpassed by more improved modern weaponry, the M60 is still seeing some use amongst the Coast Guard, the Navy, and in particular the SEALs, over 60 years after it was first deployed during the Vietnam War. Not bad for a 60-year-old machine gun, right? Now watch why new Russian body armor is completely useless or check out this video instead.